Hi, hello, mehaba. I'm Rebecca, aka Ratchet Intellectual, and today we're diving deep into a theory that threatens everything you thought you knew about Zootopia. We've all heard the basic, Zootopia is about the crack epidemic, predators are black people, it's about race relations. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. But let's take it to the next level. This is less of a cartoon theory and more of an exploration into the ideological foundation of the world of Zootopia. The movie is about the process of racialization and the social construction of group identities. The key words for American cultural studies defines racialization as a process that produces race within a particular social and political conjecture. Race or racial groups are not fixed or static, but instead are intentionally created to serve a societal purpose. Applying racialization to Zootopia might seem counterintuitive. Unlike real world races, being a predator or prey is a matter of simple biology. Who eats who? Surely the logic in Zootopia is the same, right? Right? The reality is a bit more complicated and serves as a perfect case study to explain why race, in any context, is the biggest scam to ever exist. To put it bluntly, this ain't your mama's cartoon conspiracy. Let's get started. The movie's opening shows the beginnings of the division between animals. The relationship between predator and prey thousands of years ago was supposedly based on the primitive biology. Prey always lived in fear of predators who were motivated solely by the bloodlust and biological urge to kill and maim. The vicious predator and the meek prey is essentially propaganda. I think it's fair to use real world statistics for the mammals in the movies since we only see real world animals. The idea that predators rule over prey on some king of the jungle type shit is just not true. Land mammal hunters are some of the least effective predators when compared to other animals. Tigers succeed in a hunt only 5-10% to 10 of the time. Polar bears have a kill rate of 10%, wolves 14%, lions less than 20% when they hunt alone. Hell, a domestic house cat, which isn't even shown in the movie, has a success rate of 32%. Cheetahs do have a success rate of 58%, which is pretty impressive until you look at the other 42% of the time where they're getting their back broke by a zebra. Yes, lions and wolves are scary and big and got claws, but them niggas ain't winning winning all the time. Which leads me to my second point. Prey are not helpless or defenseless. Big prey like bison have the strength to ward off attacks from wolves if they are anything less than perfect. The European rabbits can match the speeds of the Iberian lynxes who hunt them. Prey animals have a myriad of ways to protect against predators and they win more times than not. Even in the movie, at the Museum of Natural History, we see a mammoth figure holding a spear, likely a weapon used against prehistoric predators. Even back thousands of years, prey animals in their world created defense mechanisms to level the playing field. So, in the real world and the world of the film, prey are not completely helpless and predators are not completely unstoppable. Something the movie doesn't touch on is why predation would even evolve in their world. Since the animals are all one-to-one -one parallels with the animals from our world, I don't think it's a stretch to say that it must serve some function. In the real world, predators are a part of the natural balance. The world needs predation. It keeps prey populations in check, which has a positive impact on the environment. For example, in areas where natural predators have been removed, deer will overpopulate their habitats and will overgraze, which damages the ecological balance for other animals in the area. We see environmental health return to biomes after the reintroduction of predators, like in Yellowstone with the gray wolves. Clearly predation must have evolved in the movie's world to fill a similar function. Predation, in moderation, is not only natural, it could be beneficial. The question becomes who benefits from the narrative that predators equal monsters, prey equals helpless victims. The answer is simple. By demonizing even the potential of predation, the societal powers can continue to promote stratification and habitat segregation. Segregation, as seen in America, is key to maintaining a sense of hierarchy and social order. 
Gazelle says it herself. Zootopia is a unique place because all mammals are living together in supposed harmony. This means that the rest of the movie's world does not even attempt anything like equality or integration between species. We see it in Judy's hometown of Bunnyboro. Animals are usually forced to live out their ecological and thus social niche. Judy's parents say that they settled hard and imply that despite having had their own dreams, ultimately entrenched themselves into the social expectations for rabbits. We see this idea reinforced again when the racist pig at the protest tells the leopard to go back to the forest. While he gets her home habitat wrong, this phrase was supposed to mirror the go back to Mexico type sentiment aimed at Latin immigrants. This means that the animals in the film have a bigoted understanding that certain animals belong in certain spaces. We even see ecological segregation in Zootopia. The city is described as having 12 districts, but we only see Sahara Square, Tundra Town, Little Rodentia, Rainforest District, and the Savannah Central. It's implied that most other towns or cities outside of Zootopia are single biomes. These neighborhood biomes are created to mirror habitats of origin, but we see how it works as a form of socially enforced segregation. In the scene where Judy was ready to do some police brutality at the ice cream shop after an afternoon of racial profiling, we see the bigoted elephant tell Nick and Finnick to find an ice cream shop that serves foxes and says their business has the right to refuse service to anyone. In America, businesses do have the right to refuse service as long as the refusal is is not based on a protected identity. Anti-discrimination laws prevent you from denying service solely because someone is a black or a woman. Zootopia does seem to have some understanding of civil rights. Mayor Lionheart created the Mammal Inclusion Initiative to open equal opportunities to both predator and prey citizens. However, this initiative does not confirm that predator prey status are protected categories. We see here on Emmett Otterton's ID that the city government does track species, not if you're a predator or prey. Bellwether's whole plan allowed for the marginalization and exclusion of predators from society. Even in the ice cream store, Judy got Nick's possicle, not by stating that the behavior was breaking anti-discrimination laws, but because of a health code violation. With these facts, we can see that predator prey labels, while socially significant, are not protected identities and that discrimination based on predator-prey status is technically legal. Even though in the movie's world, predators no longer eat prey at all, they are still socially understood and perceived as potential threats. Even when prey no longer live in fear, being a prey animal is still largely defined as weak. Even animals like hippos and elephants, who do not generally have to fear the vast majority of predators, are still seen participating in anti-predator rhetoric. The predator-prey groups only make sense when placed in context with each other. Whether you're a predator or prey determines the assumptions and expectations people make about you. Judy was never expected to be more than a carrot farmer by her parents, community, and peers because of her racial group. Nick was never supposed to be anything more than a sly, greedy fox because of his racial group. And speaking of Nick, y'all know he's an omnivore, right? Omnivores present a problem for the predator-prey biological binary. While only 3% of animals are omnivores, that's still a lot of fucking animals. Dozens of species and millions of mammals, including even the main character, Nick. Foxes have a diverse diet. Yes, they hunt rodents and rabbits, but they also eat berries and earthworms. Why is Nick labeled and understood strictly as a predator that even elephants feel the need to discriminate against? This leads to my second point. The creators of Zootopia confirmed that predators now eat plant, insect, and fish protein. Some of the animals labeled predators already eat fish, plants, and insects prior to modernization. Case in point, Barry DiCaprio was one of the kidnapped predators turned savage at Cliffside Asylum. Barry is a grizzly bear, and 90% of the grizzly's diet is vegetation. And while they can eat other animals, their main meat source is salmon. So why in the world was he kidnapped? He was labeled a predator not because of the reality of his relationship with prey, but because of his potential for predation. 
Bellwether had him drugged and vilified for something he and Grizzlies like him never did. And people went along with it because of being a predator is not solely about biology. Just like the racist pig who yelled at the leopard, it doesn't matter where leopards are biologically located. It's about the assumed relationship to predation. And that racist pig? A hypocrite. Pigs are omnivores and will eat anything given to them. Their taste for meat is so bad that pig farmers warn about relying on meat to feed their stocks because they won't eat their regular vegetarian diet anymore. Pigs in the wild have been known to eat carcasses because they are opportunistic feeders. Many prey animals are actually opportunistic eaters and will eat bones, carcasses, and even smaller animals if need be. You could say, oh well, a pig isn't as dangerous as a panther, so it's different. And that's a valid point, but that in and of itself doesn't explain the bias against predators nor why their society is split along those lines. Why not habitat versus habitat or size versus size? A single elephant could flatten all of little rodentia. Hippos are known for their violence, porcupines have their needles, and even hedgehogs have venom. Who is and isn't considered a predator or prey is more than just who eats who. It's about who is labeled a threat. The society the societal structure of their world attempts to force everyone into a binary racial system that simplifies the complex web of interactions between thousands of unique species. At the press conference where Judy pushes race science, she herself admits that the only similarities between the 14 kidnapped mammals was that they were all a part of the predator family. A grizzly bear, a jaguar, and a river otter don't have much in common, but that didn't stop Barry DiCaprio, Emmett Otterson, and Renito Manchez from being kidnapped and labeled savage. The movie world created a coherent grouping of radically different animals who are only connected because of the possibility of predation. Omnivores subvert the binary that structures the society of the modern world, so they are forced to pick a side. Barry is a predator, but Phil the raccoon from the video game Zootopia Crime Files is a prey, despite the fact that they are both omnivores. Predator and prey, like most things, are a social construct in the movie's world. Who is and isn't a prey has nothing to do with the realities of predation and anti-predator adaptation. It doesn't matter if you never would have eaten a bunny, the fact that you could is more than enough to define what you are. The racialization process in the movie mirrors our world in understandable ways. It's messy and contradictory and so arbitrary it's stupid. Thanks for watching this. I hope it lived up to the hype. Remember to follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter if you want more shenanigans. If you want to support my channel, consider checking out my Patreon where I post exclusive content like Rebecca's Ratchet Ravings, where I answer your questions on black feminism, current events, and pop culture. That's it from me, and remember the three rules of racial justice. Our liberation needs humor. We can do political education together. And any story that ends with a marginalized minority becoming a part of the institution that criminalized them in the first place is copaganda. Fuck Officer Wild. Me and all my homies hate Officer Wild. Peace, y'all.